Hey everyone, Chat Cemetery is back, as is Becky Kovach, and we are talking all about the fifth Dark Tower book, Wolves of the Kala, today. And I want to preface this episode by saying that we have not read The Wind Through the Keyhole yet, which I know is kind of a four and a half out of the series, and that is because I'm going chronologically, which I'm sure a lot of you who have listened to this before have noticed, but I just wanted to point that out because I've heard that it kind of slots in right before this book fairly nicely, not 100% sure again, because I haven't read it. But Becky, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Um, a little tired, been kind of a long week as we were just kind of talking about, but um, doing good, excited about Wolves of Kala, because this so far is probably my favorite book in the series. Um, I also have not read Wind Through the Keyhole, so um, no spoilers there, thankfully. But yeah, how are you doing? Not bad. I am chugging away on the uh, seventh book, and it's long. <laughs> yeah, you're way ahead of me because I haven't even read um, the sixth one yet. So, well, see, the good thing for you is that you don't have to do this podcast weekly. This, this is true. You have a lot more work ahead of you. I just get to jump in where I want to. And that's kind of nice. It's perfect. Before we dive into the story, though, I would like to point out the fun fact that these chapter titles use the same font as the Harry Potter chapter titles. And once I saw it, I could not unsee it. And it drove me crazy until I figured it out to the point where I literally pulled out one of my Harry Potter books and was like, this is the same. I didn't even notice it until I saw you post about it online, which like, I love the Harry Potter books, everything else problematic about J.K. Rowling aside, I love the Harry Potter series. So the fact that I didn't notice, I'm kind of disappointed in myself. <laughs> I but, was a little surprised you didn't notice either. I was like, wait, I feel like Becky is the person who should have noticed this right. out of the two of us. Exactly. Right. Like when you posted it, I had to look back at my book and I went, oh my God. She's right. It was just one of those fun things because then you have the snitches mention in this mm -hmm. too later on. And I was like, Stephen King loves him some Harry Potter. <laughs> Apparently. Or wh when did this when did this come out versus when did the Harry Potter books come out? Which one came first? I think the Harry Potter books came first because if I'm not mistaken, those started in like the late 90s. And this was a 2003 release, I believe. Yeah, you're right. That sounds about right. Yeah. So this came out like in the midst of the Harry Potter books, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if they were finished by 2003, but it's like right around that time period where you're like, I don't know. I was 10. <laughs> yeah. I Because I started reading the Harry Potter books when I was like eight or nine and Wolves of Kala came out when I was like 11, if it was 2003. So yeah, it's like they kind of overlapped, I guess. Yeah. And for my copy, I had illustrations, which were done by Bernie Wrightson, who is a fantastic artist. And unfortunately, your book did not have those. So I'm a little bummed you didn't get to see those. Me too, especially because it means I had 920 pages of straight text. To be fair, they didn't count towards the page count. Okay. But it was still a nice little, hey, look at this. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice to just have that to kind of break things up. Because um, this is definitely a hefty book to dive into. Yeah, you said your copy was about 900-ish pages. Mine was somewhere in the 700 range because I had the hardcover versus you having the paperback. And mm -hmm. page numbers always change when you're changing the size of the book and the format of the book. But I think what this story does well is it kind of keeps the story centralized again. They don't go very many places they I mean they do and they don't but the thing is like the whole Katet is fighting against these Dr. Doom like looking wolves and as soon as I saw the illustration because there was an illustration of one of the wolf bots in this if you will and I was like that looks exactly like Dr. Doom <laughs> and then yeah. later at the end of the book or towards the end of the book it specifically mentions Dr. Doom. And I was like, oh, okay. I, I see what you did there, Stephen King. You're throwing Harry Potter at me and Marvel. Yeah, because then um, he throws a, like a few weird references that kind of like bring it back to what I guess I would consider like our world. Because then the wolves also have things that are, they sound like they're very reminiscent of like lightsabers. Mm -hmm. So between that and the snitches and the Dr. Doom 
robots. Like he's really just throwing everything in. Especially since we came from the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. It's it's a lot of jumping around from fan, fan fandom to fandom here. Yeah, and there's another character in this who plays a big role, and that is Father Callahan, who comes from the Salem's Lot novel, which is King's second published book. So I read this quite a while ago, and I was like, I know the name, but tell me more. And Becky, I know you haven't read Salem's Lot. So for you, what was the integration of Father Callahan like? Was it confusing? Was it one of those things where you're like, oh, here's a King connection that I don't really understand, but we're just going to roll with it? Yeah, I I mean, it didn't it didn't even register with me until they kind of revealed that at the end of the book, because having not read it, like I wouldn't have recognized the name of like I wouldn't have recognized his name or the name of like where he's from, which is Salem's Lot. Um, so for me, I just kind of saw him as another character that they introduced to kind of further the plot along. And throughout the book, um, Roland especially makes kind of notes to himself that it seems like Father Callahan is meant to be a part of their catet. K- I don't know how to say I that. I don't know which it is either still. <laughs> um, so in my mind, he was just like, oh, here's another character who's going to play a role somehow in like the rest of their story. And then at the end of the book, it throws in that kind of fourth wall break where it's like, oh, he sees Stephen King's book, Salem's Lot, that kind of describes the story that Father Callahan has already told us. Leave it to Stephen King to insert his own books in his other books. (laughs) Yeah, right? The funny thing is that he makes so many connections in all of the books, especially ones that tie to the Dark Tower. And I actually recently started making YouTube videos and did a video on what my preferred Dark Tower reading order would have been had I not been doing things chronologically. And I did leave out a big book because it has a connection to the Dark Tower, but it's not one that I think people need to read all 1100 plus pages of it in order to understand the Dark Tower, because you certainly won't be reading it anytime soon, right? Probably not. Yeah, so even if you don't read all of these little stories or other novels that somehow tie into the Dark Tower, if you read the main seven books and then The Wind Through the Keyhole, if you wish, and I know you will read that one at least, Mm -hmm. that'll give you a full story. From what I can tell, I'm not quite done with book seven, like I said, and haven't read The Wind Through the Keyhole, but he makes it so that if you read everything you get rewarded with these connections. But if you don't, you can still understand what's going on. Yeah, it's kind of like fun little Easter eggs. Like when you're watching a movie and you see like characters or props show up from other movies. I know like Disney and Pixar do that a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's kind of what it feels like he's doing here by throwing in all of these other little things. Yeah, and it's just fun to pick up on them. And admittedly, even though I'm doing this podcast, I don't catch all of them just because at the speed with the speed that I'm reading through these books, it's hard for my brain to retain everything. And maybe that's, you know, my well, obviously, it is my own fault for doing a weekly Stephen King (laughs) podcast. But I felt like this was the best way for me to get through everything. And especially the Dark Tower, because the books kind of started out decent length. You know, the gunslinger's not too long of a book, and then they kind of get progressively longer. And we were just discussing how Song of Susanna is a little shorter, thankfully, for your schedule. And then the seventh book is way longer. It's definitely the longest of all of them, I think. And with Wolves of the Cala, this felt like a nice story where you can kind of almost take a breather and just get to know the characters a little more, especially Mm -hmm. Susanna, I think, because she's going through quite a bit. And obviously, the next book will focus even more on her. But you have all of our main characters doing things kind of on their own. And then they're kind of mostly together as well. And you really get a feeling that, hey, this is where the story is going to take off. Yeah, Um, And this is definitely, I think I said it before, this is probably my favorite of the series so far. It feels like it's got the best pacing, too. I never felt like anything was really dragging out. Um, Even when we have more of those, like, stories within stories that I feel like we've seen a lot of in this series. Like Father Callahan telling his background to our four, like, main characters. 
it never really felt like it got slow, which was nice. And with everybody's like side adventures, like you said, you do still, you get to see more of like them and what they're like. I want to focus on Susanna a little though, because we already know about Detta and Odetta, mm-hmm. what have you. And then we find out about this other personality, Mia, during the time we spend with them in this novel. And Susanna has been impregnated by the demon, but because of the condition her body is in, she is not able to necessarily carry the demon baby on her own. So Mia shoulders that and... It's really interesting how they introduce that personality and how it changes Susanna's behavior so much because we're used to seeing the other personality at this point. Yeah. You know, we're five books in now and then they throw a wrench in it with another personality on top of that. Right. Like at this point, we think that Susanna has been fixed. She's been made whole like. She is no longer split between Odetta and Detta. She is now just Susanna. And then we find out there's this other personality kind of lurking beneath. And the way that they introduce her is Roland following her through the woods when she wakes up as Mia one night to feed this baby, the thing that she calls the chap that's like growing inside her. But it's weird because she's not really showing any signs of pregnancy at this point. Like she hasn't grown at all she's still getting her period which is like why would anybody think she was pregnant at that point yeah then again it's a demon baby i guess it screws things up yeah the rules are probably a little bit different there are none (laughs) exactly um but like roland being as observant as he is has noticed that she's a little bit off there are nights where she like rubs her temple like she's getting a headache almost and then like her movements get a little bit jerky she Just like something about her changes and he knows that those are the nights where she's going to wake up as Mia and go off and like feed. And like in her mind, she is in like a banquet hall and eating these grand great things. But in reality, she's like popping the heads off of frogs and eating their guts. Sounds so fun. Yeah. Some great imagery right there. Yeah. And King is really good at that kind of stuff, though, because... You have these characters taking on this big, important battle, basically, for Caliber and Sturgis. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know. But to dive into the story a little more, basically, they end up at this farming village and the people need their help because these Dr. Doom wolf bot things. I don't even know what I don't even know what to call them. (laughs) The wolves. I know, but they're not really wolves and then the robots and then they got the dr doom like hoods on it's just so much to take in so the villagers all call them wolves though because they wear like these fake wolf masks we will go with that for the purposes of making everyone's life easier and yes you get a lot of plotting in this not necessarily for the story as a whole in regard to the tower, but for them figuring out how they're going to defeat the wolves. Yeah. And by comparison, it's a whole lot of plotting and then very small amounts of action. Like the entire book is them planning and building up to the wolves arrival because they have this robot that tells them exactly what day the wolves are going to be there. Um, And then the actual like, battle with the wolves is over fairly quickly. And that's not to say the lack of action makes the story boring by any means, because you have all of these nuances going on in the farming village. So not only are we spending more time with our main characters, we're getting to know how these people in this village work and what they all do you have the stories basically that are going around of how this happens every so often and the kids are taken and there's so much that is interesting about it that you don't need the action to make you feel like the story is moving along right because I feel like this is the first like village that we have actually seen in this world that's moved on Mm -hmm. Um, everything else we've kind of gotten has been in flashbacks just like Roland telling his story to the rest of them or like 
we had, I guess, the city of Ludd, where it was like the older people and the younger younger people who were warring. But this is the first time we're in a community where they, they do live in peace and are like a functioning community. Yeah. And in case anyone is only really interested in the Dark Tower novels and hasn't read Salem's Lot like yourself, to quickly sum that up, Father Callahan battled with the vampire who came to that town, Kurt Barlow, and after that encounter, he was able to identify type 3 vampires with a blue aura, whatever that means. I don't really know. (laughs) Don't know that much about vampires. I think it means that they've got like a blue light that he can see kind of around them. Okay, that makes sense. And he actually was lured into a trap and died, and then he entered Midworld in 83. So this is where the low men come in. And there's a story called Low Men in Yellow Coats that ties into this along with the Little Sisters of Eluria. So you have these additional stories that kind of just explain a few things and, you know, The low men kind of go after people who are wanted for whatever reason. There's a wide variety of of reasons, and that's what forced Callahan into exile. So that's kind of where he came from and how he entered Midworld. So in the real world, he is dead. Yes, which is much like Jake's story. Yes. Because he died and ended up in Midworld, but then he died in Midworld and went back to the real world, and then came through a doorway. Yeah. So that's the gist of how Father Callahan came to be in Midworld, and he's someone who kind of helps our main characters navigate through this whole thing, and he's kind of a pain at times. Sometimes he's helpful, sometimes not so much. (laughs) Yeah. I kind of like Father Callahan, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he also, he's got one of the, the glass balls. Right. Black 13. Uh, yes. Which there, it's like the, the wizard's rainbow, right? And there's, there's 13 of them. This is the last one. And the most dangerous. Yes, that is correct. My brain was like, that sounds right. <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. Um, and that actually ends up playing an important role too because they use it to kind of manipulate this door in a cave so that they can go back to whatever, where, and when they want to. Yeah, and they go back to New York. So you have this village, and then you have the stark contrast of that with their time spent in New York. And if I'm not mistaken, they go back to New York in 77, So Mm -hmm. 1970s New York is a vibe. (laughs) It's a good way to put it. It's a vibe. It is. Um, Yeah. So this is, and this ends up, this is like our other story that's happening kind of parallel to what's going on in the village of Calibre and Sturgis. And you need everything to come together in the end. Otherwise the whole thing is just not going to work at all. Right. And I'm guessing that's what the Dark Tower book is going to be, is everything kind of coming together? I hope so. We'll see. (laughs) We'll see. That's the gist of this series so far. We will see. (laughs) Should have been the tagline for all the books. Yeah, right? Did you have a preference over story location? Did you like the parts in New York more than the village or vice versa? Or do you think they both worked equally well? Um, I think they both worked equally well. I think I liked the parts in the village better just because I was starting to really like the people there um, and getting to know more of the villagers. Um, whereas in New York, the, the main characters that we really see are Calvin Tower and his friend Aaron Deepno. I think that's how you say it. Um, so there's not as much that's going on there as there is in the village. Yeah, I think the thing with the New York scenes is it brings out this sort of anger in Eddie in particular, and there's a sense of urgency, too, on both sides. But with New York, everything feels a little grittier, and it feels like it might not go well. But then when you have Roland back with the villagers, and you feel like 
everything's going to be okay there. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, especially with time moving differently in New York and kind of moving quicker. Yeah. That, like you said, there's more of a sense of urgency there. So I, yeah, that's true. Which was good because it wasn't like they were trying to tell these two stories at kind of the same pace. They had more time to plan at the village. Whereas in New York, it was like, okay, come on, let's go. We got to get this done and then we got to get back and then we got to fight the wolves. So, you know, there was yeah that sense of urgency that helped with the pacing of this book, I think. And we both agree that the pacing of this one was done really well because it's a long book, but it doesn't drag on. Right. It goes by pretty quickly. It helps a lot that like each of these chapters is also broken down into like shorter sections within. Yeah. Um, which is like, for me, that's the best way to be reading something. I don't like super long chapters where I have, cause I feel like I have to finish the chapter before I can Same. like <laughs> stop. So if, I cannot go to bed until I finish this chapter. <laughs> right. So if a chapter is like 30 pages long, that could take a little while, but if you have these smaller sections that are more of a natural stopping point, it's a little bit easier um, and seems it seems a little less daunting, too. Yeah, because they almost act as scene changes. So it's like, okay, we're going to visit with Eddie in New York for a little bit, and then we're going to pop in on the village, and then we're going to kind of go back and forth. So it makes it easier to be like, okay, I got to this point. We can pause, you know, we can eat dinner, we can do some, something else for a little bit. And, you know, this, the seventh book is like that as well that I'm reading now, because I think I saw that one chapter was like 60 pages. And I was like, good thing there's sections, because yeah. reading that in one sitting probably won't happen. Right. And it just feels so wrong to stop, like, in the middle. Yeah. So I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> I am glad we read the same weird way. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people probably read that way. Or I don't know. Maybe, I hope so. Maybe we just have short attention spans. Yeah. I was telling you I read like 120 pages of the seventh book yesterday and my brain felt like mush after <laughs> reading that much of it in one day. And I was like, okay, you know, because I'm trying to get through it, but I want to understand it too. Right. And I think that's one of the things with Stephen King. With this one in particular, I felt like it was easy to understand what was going on. Yeah. Because there were moving pieces, so to speak, but there weren't so many to where you were bouncing around all over the place. It's like, we mostly have our two locations. We know what's going to happen. We know this battle is coming. We don't know the outcome yet, but we know it's coming. Right. There's, yeah, like you said, there's a lot less moving parts. There's a lot less, like conflicting storylines like some of the earlier books there was a lot of back and forth between past and present and it got to the point where it was a little bit confusing and I was never quite sure where we were at any given time mm -hmm. um, whereas with this it's a lot more straightforward there isn't as much of that bouncing around and other than the two storylines in Calibre and Sturgis and New York the only other story that we really get is Father Callahan's and that comes and goes pretty quickly and then you're done with it. Yeah, with the Dark Tower series, what King loves to do is have characters tell stories. Yes. And I feel like that's where you can get into a little trouble with keeping everything straight. Because when you're telling a story, one, it might not be that accurate. Sometimes our minds play tricks on us and we remember things differently from how they actually happen. But we've seen with Roland time and time again throughout the series how he just sits and tells stories mm -hmm. for hours on end and then you're like wait was that a whole story are we still in the story right um now that I'm thinking about it I guess we do get one other story within this book and that's um grand grandpairs it's a uh, Tion's grandfather Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he tells a story of a time that him and, like, a bunch of his friends decided to take a stand against the wolves, like, many, many years ago. And one of them actually managed to kill one. And he tells the story to Eddie and tells Eddie what it is that they saw when they removed the mask. And that's when Roland is kind of able to start formulating this plan of how to defeat them. Yeah. And you have other elements that come into play in this story. So you have Benny Sleitman's father who winds up being the traitor. And yeah. 
you have that whole kind of side story that very much applies to why the whole main story is happening, but it's something that kind of takes you away from what's coming and Roland has to deal with this situation and he doesn't deal with it in the way you would expect Roland to deal with it. No, you would think that he he would just kind of sentence the traitor to death almost. Yeah. Um, But he actually responds pretty like sensitively to the situation Mm -hmm. and spares him. And I think that has to do with the fact that Jake is kind of growing on him. Yeah. We start to see Roland have a lot more like emotion in this book Mm -hmm. and can kind of see him softening as a result of his time with the other three. Um, And reversely, he's also been rubbing off on them a lot. They are starting to act more like gunslingers. And this is really the first time within the series, I think, that we see them as gunslingers. Yeah. I also love the plate throwing women. Yeah. They are amazing. It's great. Yeah, and I love that Roland utilizes them within the battle. Yeah, because with someone like Roland, you would almost expect him to be like, no, this is a man's job. But he does not care. He was like, whoever will get the job done, I do not care. Right. You would almost expect him to be like like an old school, like very, he is very gruff, but just like, no, woman's place isn't on the battlefield. But no, he actually, like, he's the one who thinks that it would be a great idea to have them get involved he organizes the whole thing and like the whole plan is his yeah i want to talk a little about the children and in particular the brother and sister who kind of get stuck when jake is helping all the kids get to the rice patch i believe it is nearby and you have the boy who gets stuck in a hole or something and like breaks his leg and the sister won't leave him and jake's kind of like oh no, we've hit a snag. And he's kind of panicking, but he's also trying to do his best to keep calm. Yeah. Which, like, within that, we kind of see these two sides of Jake. One being that he still is just a kid. Like, what is he? I think they say he's like 12 or something like that. It's like 12 or 13. Not that old. He's like, he's still very young. So like, yeah, he's a kid and kids freak out when things go wrong. But then on the other hand, like, he's a gunslinger. He's been training with Roland. He's already been through so many things. And I think that that's something that we kind of see a lot in this book as well, is just, like, those two warring personalities within him, where, like, he makes a friend in Benny Slightman Jr. and, like, very much just wants to be a boy and, like, run around and play games. But then on the other hand, he has a huge role to play in this war that's coming. Yeah, it's really interesting how they utilize Jake in this, too, because he's given more responsibility than usual. And you know that they all have this sort of connection. So he doesn't just completely freak out. He tries to kind of rationalize his way through things. And he's like, okay, you know, you do this, you do this, and then we'll lift. And he's trying to figure it out. And Roland knows that something has gone wrong. They can, him and the others can sense that, but he's just kind of like, Jake can handle it. We'll let him deal with it. And I think he instills confidence in Jake in that moment to figure it out and get the kids through this. Right. And, and that's part of them just being like cadet too, is being able to sense things about each other. And Mm -hmm. with Jake, especially that, that seems to be like a very strong gift that he has yeah. Um, so we also see him kind of stepping up when he realizes that, like, something's wrong. Like, he sees Susanna as Mia in, like, a dream one night, and he approaches Roland and realizes that Roland knew, and he's the one who kind of tells Roland off for not telling the rest of them and for hiding it for so long. Yeah. Do you have any moments in particular that really stood out to you during this? Um. I'm trying to think, not necessarily moments, but um, I think I said to you earlier before we started that I wanted to bring up something that I noticed as I was reading this. There's some like weird parallels to the Lord of the Rings books. Tell me more. Um, So for starters, you have this like group of people who are on a quest together to find some place that is of great importance. 
It's like in Lord of the Rings, you have the Fellowship of the Ring traveling to Mordor to destroy the ring and save the world. There's also the Crimson King that they talk about in this book a lot, especially. And like the Eye of the Crimson King, which always just made me think of like the Eye of Sauron. So it just, and like the Dark Tower, like the Lord of the Rings, like the Two Towers, like it just, there was a lot of things where I was like, wow, I feel like I'm reading another version of Lord of the Rings. (laughs) So I have a quick confession to make after listening to you talk about that. I have seen the Lord of the Rings movies, have not read any of the books. Okay, but like you get those... That's a lie. I've read The Hobbit. You get those references, though. Yeah, I mean, I have the books sitting on my shelf. It's just a matter (laughs) of me actually getting to them. Because as you know, Becky, and as some of the listeners may already know, Stephen King writes very long books. Yeah, and writes a lot of them. So many, so (laughs) many. I think at this point, I have read somewhere around 45 of them. Wow. Yeah. I got nothing to say other than wow. (laughs) Um, But yeah, that was that was something that was definitely in the back of my mind a lot as I was reading through this was all of these things that just like, made me think of the Lord of the Rings series as I was reading. I guess in terms of like a specific moment that stood out for me was definitely when Benny Slateman Jr. dies. Yeah. Because it was just so devastating. Like this young kid, his father was a traitor to the entire village for the sake of saving his son. And then his son does not survive. It's almost like that was the father's sentence. Yes. Very, yeah, very much so. Like Roland didn't have to punish him because he ended up getting punished enough. Yeah, because that's like the ultimate punishment for a parent. Yeah. Yeah. To have to bury a child. And like the the way in which he dies is just so horrible. Because it's not just like he's shot and like it's quick. He is blown up. Like the way they just, they describe like the, the snitches is like you implode from inside. Like just not great. Yeah. One thing we haven't touched on just yet is the doorway cave. Yeah. We haven't touched on that specifically um, but that that's like how I guess that's how they go back and forth to New York, right? Yeah. So you have them coming and going through that when Eddie has to go to New York and take care of things. But then you also have that as the place where the Black 13 was found. Yes. And where, where Father Callahan, yeah. yeah, where he comes through. Right. So that's kind of his entryway into this world world and then it's also where Susanna flees yeah um and they talk a lot about how before the doorway appeared it was the cave of voices and like when you step inside you hear all of these voices that like aren't actually there but it's all people that you know saying like basically calling out your insecurities yeah and you have the fact that when Susanna or technically Mia flees the guys go to follow her and then it's like the door's closed by the time they get there. So they just miss her. And obviously Eddie is like, we have to go, we have to go, we have to go get her. And, you know, he's like panicking about it. And Roland understands, but he's kind of like, yeah, but the tower. Yeah. And this is where we kind of see the old Roland return a little bit where like he's not, he hasn't gotten as soft as he might seem at times. He still is very just, He's on this quest to the tower, and that's the only thing that matters to him. Yeah, and I also want to talk a little more about Calvin Tower, because one, I wish that bookstore was real and I can go into it. (laughs) Seems like a fun bookstore. It does. It does. And that's where Father Callahan sees Salem's Lot. Yes. And he's like, oh, this Stephen King dude, he wrote my story. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine walking into a bookstore and seeing a book that's literally your life? (laughs) That would be boring. (laughs) It would also be trippy. In my case. (laughs) But it's one of those things where Stephen King gets very meta. It's not the first time he's put one of his books in another one of his stories, but it's the first time you've had a character interact with their own story. Okay. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, because sometimes he'll 
toss in little lines like, oh, and the security guard was reading Dolores Claiborne or whatever. You know, it's something along those lines. It's always just like, hey, this person was reading a book. But in this instance, Father Callahan is like, you know what? This story seems familiar. (laughs) Yeah. And it's like, oh, right. That's mine. Yeah. So it's very meta. It's very Stephen King of him. Yeah. It's very cerebral. Yeah. And sometimes I'm just like, why? Why, though? (laughs) Because he's Stephen King and he can. And that's the only answer I have ever come up with (laughs) thus far. So There is no explanation. (laughs) We are clearly on the same page there, but I just wanted to quickly bring that up. And Calvin Tower is a pretty stubborn man. Yeah. And as someone who has a lot of books in the room that I am sitting in, I kind of understand, you know? I don't want people messing with my books. Right. And especially like his one condition for like leaving New York after Eddie goes to speak to him about selling the lot is like saving all of his valuable books. And like, I do kind of get it because when you are a collector who cares so deeply about something as he does, like those things become so important to you. You don't want to lose them. And these are like rare books for one reason or another. So why would he ever want to risk them? Exactly. And while most of my books are not super valuable, you know, it's like they mean something to me. So there are certain ones I want to keep. There are certain ones that I'll probably read and let go of because I have five bookshelves full of books. And that is so many, so many books. I don't know when I will read them all, but it will. I I keep all of mine. I don't get rid of books. Sometimes I see a free little library and I trade in a book for another book. Okay. <laughs> but there are some where it's just like, you know, I'll I'll definitely keep all of the Stephen King books because there are some that I'll probably want to go revisit at some point when I don't have to read them for the purpose of this podcast. And there are like reference books I have that I'll never get rid of more than likely, you know, I have like the Star Wars visual dictionary or something like that. And it's like, that's useful because there's a lot going on in Star Wars too. So sometimes you just need a little help remembering what all of it is. Yeah. I've never, I've never actually seen or read Star Wars. I'll pretend you didn't say that. (laughs) That's the one series that everybody, when they find out I haven't like See, at least seen the movies is very confused about because it, everyone's always like, oh, that seems like something you would love. I'm like, I know. Yeah, I it kind of does. I'm, I'm like, I know. I just never got around to it. Sorry. <laughs> it's on my list. Becky's busy. Okay, people. <laughs> no, I just haven't done it because I feel like she's busy playing Animal Crossing still. Yeah. I also started taking guitar lessons. so I'm doing that now too. Oh, well, you know, that's productive. The yeah. Learning new things. That's good. Yeah. No, Star Wars is on my list. It's just one of those things that I'm never going to sit and watch by myself. Yeah. Like, I need somebody else with me. That's fair. Anyway. To bring it back to the book, though, is there anything... There are obviously things we haven't touched on, actually, but is there anything specific we haven't brought up that you want to bring up before we start wrapping up here? I feel like we've touched on all of the major things. We haven't talked a ton. Like, we've we've talked about the villagers in passing, mm-hmm. but we haven't talked about specific people all that much. There's also, there's, like, the, the, the Manny folk, the Mani folk. Yeah. Don't know how to pronounce that either. I don't know how to pronounce anything. I don't know why I host a podcast. No. I actually host two. Nope. So. It's, like, their own religious people within the village, not, like, Christian people. Like, Father right. Callahan built a church there, but... I don't I don't know quite what they are. Yeah, you know, I'm not 100% sure either. I will try <laughs> to find out for you right now. But yeah. Okay, so you hit it on the nose with religious group. That is correct. Okay. And they worship things called the Over and the Force, which <laughs> Star Wars reference probably yeah. again. <laughs> and they also have their own kind of language it's mostly the same as english but there's some differences and it says here they appear similar to the quakers and the amish so that is what they look like and they have fingernails that they're only allowed to cut twice a year that sounds 
terrifying. <laughs> I wish I hadn't read that, but I had to share it with you all because I had to read it. Yeah. Now I'm going to have nightmares about that, but it's cool. You're welcome. That's another That's another thing that I meant to bring up with the like the Lord of the Rings kind of parallels is the idea of like this other language. So like with Lord of the Rings, he created Elvish and then he wrote the Lord of the Rings books so that he would have some way to use it. Not quite the same with Stephen King, but these characters in Midworld do have like their own way of speaking. Mm -hmm. In this case, it just happens to be like, it's, it's basically English, but with like some other words thrown in and like the high, I think it's the high language. High speech, I think. High speech is like its own language in itself too, which that one's a little bit different because it does have its own characters and everything. Like on the door, it says unfound. Um, but like language is another like really big part of these books as well. They also have their own way of traveling between the worlds. Yeah. So it's definitely an interesting group of people to introduce because now that I've read what they're described like, you're like, yep, I, I get that. I see that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. This makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it takes getting that kind of description or even, you know, with the illustration, seeing something in order to understand, oh, okay, like, I don't know if it was this book or if it's in one of the other two, Song of Susanna or The Dark Tower, but there's a picture of Oi. And I was like, finally, I know what this uh, creature looks like. I In my head, he's like, kind of like a hedgehog. I know that's not right. It's, but... No, it's not even close. <laughs> that's the one thing I, I do wish I had gotten some version of the book that had at least some illustrations because I think it would be very helpful to have at certain points yeah and that's why when the wolves popped up and there was an image I was like oh Dr. Doom I understand <laughs> yeah I that's another thing where I just kind of like have this image in my head that is probably way off yeah, I will say we were very off with Oi, and I will have to send you some of these pictures just so you can get to see them. Because there's not a lot in each book. It's not like there's one every single chapter. I think there's maybe somewhere between 12 to 15 in each book. Okay. I just I just Googled a picture. I just Googled Oi, and it's not even close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, Oh, okay. Well, now I know at least. So I found some of the illustrations to be really helpful. And because of the style that Bernie writes and draws in, and it, it just blends so well with the Dark Tower story because Bernie writes in as someone who did the Swamp Thing comics okay, back in the day, if I'm not mistaken. And it's just like he has this style that kind of oozes creature-like characters and these kind of weird, creepy things going on. Yeah, that sounds perfect for this series. Yeah. So is there anything else you want to touch on? Like I said, there's so much with these books. We could probably sit here with the books in front of us and go chapter by chapter and be like, and there's this and this and this, and then this episode would be eight hours long. Yeah, you could do a whole series of episodes on every single one of these books because there's just so many things to unpack with each one. But um, I think I think we have covered the general gist of everything. Yeah, I think so too. And like you said, you could break this down and do one or two chapters an episode and still probably not cover everything because, you know, I've listened to some episodes of the Ringers podcast binge mode where they were going through the Harry Potter books every two or three chapters at a time, give or take. And that is very in-depth. And yeah. I don't think my brain could handle doing that for the Dark Tower because it might break my brain. No. Yeah. With Harry Potter, I feel like it's a little easier because those are kids' books. Also that, very different. <laughs> um, with Stephen King, it's it's there's a lot more to it. I have honestly felt like my brain has been melting while I read the seventh book. So I don't I don't know how you're doing this. So I don't either. I just I don't think about it. I do think about it all the time, actually. That's a lie. <laughs> I was gonna say not thinking about it is probably the best way to go. 
I should probably try that. But Becky, thank you so much for coming on to talk about Wolves of the Cala. We probably pronounced half of the words wrong in this podcast, probably. but that's okay because I don't know if anyone knows how to pronounce them other than Stephen King. Right. So who's to say we're wrong? <laughs> Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. King, if you're listening, please feel free to contact us to correct any mispronunciations. <laughs> yes, please, because I'm sure more of these words will come up in the next book, which is Song of Susanna, and you will be back for that, Becky. So I'm looking forward to chatting with you again soon. Yeah, I'm ready to start that one. So let's do it. All right, that does it for this episode of Chat Cemetery. You can support the podcast on Patreon for a dollar a month. You'll get a thank you on the show for $2 a month. I will send you a Chat Cemetery sticker. And if you want to follow us on social media, you can do so at Chat Cemetery on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You could also rate and review the show. That's a huge help. And as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Mm-hmm.